Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. I'm, in what, I'm with one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament, the prominent Finnish politician Heidi Hautala. She was Finland's Minister of International Development and State Ownership in 2011 to 13. And before that, she had been an MP in the Finnish Parliament for six years. She's also a veteran of the European Parliament, having served several mandates starting in 1995. She's a member of the Group of the Greens, and her areas of interest include sustainable and responsible corporate behavior and the environmental consequences of the war in Ukraine. Heidi Hauseler, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you. Let's start with the nature restoration law, which uh, the European Parliament passed a few days ago. That must have been a pretty exciting moment for you. It was. It was because um, uh, this question of, uh, of uh, the green transition has now become uh, already a kind of a tool in a bigger political game, mm -hmm. you know, and because the European elections are approaching. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm pretty relieved that the mm -hmm. parliament now has a position to negotiate on mm -hmm. with the member states. Mm -hmm. And um, we all made a lot of compromises who, mm -hmm. who supported uh, uh, yeah. the, the outcome, but it's there and we can continue. And now we realize how important nature protection is also uh, to combat climate change. They are very much interlinked. Are you, are you expecting a lot of resistance from member states going forward in these so-called trilogues now? Well, actually, uh, this is a unique situation because the parliament's position is slightly weaker than the council's position. Mm. And uh, so I would say that uh, perhaps uh, this time around mm. the resistance might come from some elements in the European Parliament. But mm. uh, let's try to make the best mm. out of it that fits to all different conditions around Europe. When you say some elements, I assume you're talking about the European People's Party and the European conservatives and reformists who have been coming closer together in the last few months. What, the da what does that tell you about the European elections? Well, it, um, it shows to me, first of all, that um, unfortunately uh, European political parties are not immune to uh, spreading disinformation and fake news. Because there, there was a lot of fake news around this proposal. Uh, and, uh, you know, even in Finland, uh, the story uh, by, by the um, right-wing parties is that even Father Christmas would need to move away from Finland if uh, the, the EU would put in place this law. And of course, the Father Christmas uh, stays and live, continues to live in Rovaniemi in northern, northern <laughs> Finland. There's no doubt. <laughs> okay, let's talk a bit about the other um, big event uh, of the last few days, the NATO summit in Vilnius, because obviously you're one of the uh, most staunch uh, supporters of uh, Ukraine in this chamber here. Uh, wh what did you make of President Zelensky? criticism of NATO saying that it was unprecedented and absurd for Ukraine not to be given a time frame to even receive an, an invitation. I, I think um, uh, President mm. Zelensky has all the reasons uh, to, to call for more support in order to get uh, uh, as much as he can. And um, uh, now it's clear that uh, it's not anymore a taboo to, to discuss um, the future uh, membership of Ukraine in NATO. It was a taboo because of Putin and Russia until September last year, I believe. So I think he can he can be relatively happy that um, now I'm sure that uh, there will be a um, uh, follow-up uh, on, on this sort of uh, promise that for him, of course, is vague, but it's still a step. You've been to Kiev quite recently uh, to join an international working group on the environmental consequences of war. And uh, I understand that the working group is now uh, carrying out various tasks, evaluating the damage uh, um, uh, and then working on a possible future transition for Ukraine away mm -hmm. from fossil fuels and so forth. Just tell us a bit about the latest on that. Yeah, so um, uh, some of us were invited by President Zelensky himself to, to start to, to, to support Ukraine in the efforts of, uh, of uh, assessing and, and um, remedying the uh, huge environmental uh, destruction that this war has meant. So indeed, uh, we have to, we are, we are politicians and, and let's say um, public personalities. We are not researchers, but mm. we have to sort of try to make political recommendations to Zelensky's government 
government on, on mm -hmm. how, to, how to sort of have the best uh, conclusion of the assessments of various kinds that have been made on this mm -hmm. destruction. But mm -hmm. very importantly, President Zelensky speaks about ecocide. Mm. And that is like uh, something to be considered by the side of genocide. It's like a huge, massive destruction of environment uh, with, with uh, you know, intentional destruction. And I think um, uh, it will be very important that we will see how um, Russia can be made accountable for this kind of war crimes that, to, in my, my mind, they amount to what now has been started to be discussed uh, as geno e ecocide. And thirdly, we're talking already to, to the best uh, experts of uh, sustainable development to, to see how they could um, present a kind of a roadmap for Ukraine of uh, you know, building back in a sustainable way after the war. Yeah. Speaking of, of um, sustainable development, you, uh, you, you worked a lot on the corporate sustainability sustainability due diligence directive and I know you've been very active on social media as well saying mm -hmm. that this is a big step forward just briefly explain to us what that is and what what the next steps are yeah I'm happy to say that France is a front-running country in this mm -hmm. and I, I, I made this remark uh, to President Macron when he was presenting the the French presidency of EU to us uh, last uh, January I believe it was mm -hmm. and um, Indeed, uh, the idea is that uh, the global challenges like poverty, um, uh, climate change, um, nature destruction uh, is all in such a massive scale that we need uh, corporations and enterprises also to, to be part of the change. And now the EU is the first uh, region which is putting in place mandatory requirements for larger companies to, to, to just do that, to, mm -hmm. to make sure that they don't have human rights violations, child labour, deforestation in the value chains of their products and services. Do, do, do the companies get any sort of help though to adapt because it's going to cost yeah. them something so they have to take the money out of somewhere else obviously to do this? Yeah well I would say that um, a lot of it is that uh, companies must uh, uh, unlearn old bad habits not to take into account human rights and environment and to learn new habits and uh, sure there will be um, uh, guidance there is already guidance by, by international organizations and the best companies I can tell you are already doing this for, for up to 10 years because uh, this, this framework comes from the United Nations Human Rights Council from 2011 and it's quite well known for, for the best companies. But yes, especially the small and medium-sized enterprises are out of the scope at the moment mm -hmm. and if they want to get involved, uh, the EU uh, is there to, to help them to, to do this. Let's talk a bit about the, the rule of law, which is also one of your areas of interest. Uh, MEPs have recently suggested that if uh, a, a Polish law that aims supposedly to look at Russian interference, if that stays on the statute books, then the European Commission should launch an infringement procedure against uh, Poland. Essentially, there are people in this chamber who want to take a tougher line on Poland, I think we can mm. say. Uh, wh where, do you, where do you stand on that? Would it be counter Counterproductive to try and put that sort of pressure on Poland. No, I, I think it's necessary because uh, you know the EU is um, is uh, preaching to to other countries outside the EU that uh, you know they must fulfil conditionalities on on rule of law, independent judiciary. If we don't do that at home, among our member states, then I mean our our lessons to other countries are just useless. And mm. you can also see that the rule of law is the the, the very basis of EU cooperation because there's basically nothing can be built without rule of law even for companies it's clear that they need a legal certainty so yes I believe that the, the EU has to be tough with with this Polish law clearly it has a hidden agenda to stop the opposition and we've seen how bad uh, things can go in in Hungary uh, and we still have the possibility to to let's say to have uh, fair elections a possibility for for a change in government through a peaceful elections so, so you're concerned in, in about part. you're concerned obviously about what all this means for um, tr election transparency uh, th the way that it's held in mm -hmm. in Poland which is I think October or November it's supposed to yeah, be yeah exactly held. so so, so um, people say that in Poland uh, it's still possible to save democracy through elections. In Hungary, 
some people say it's not any more possible. Maybe I'm not that uh, pessimistic, but nevertheless, it's very important mm -hmm. because uh, these sort of um, breaches of rule of law are something that are spreading because authoritarianism is spreading in the world. Also, unfortunately, within the EU. Let's talk a little bit about the situation in, in Finland and uh, you're obviously uh, an opponent of the, of the current government and you're certainly no friend of the party of the Finns. Um, what do you make of the, uh, these sort of rolling scandals in the, in the Finnish coalition that we keep seeing? Well, um, uh, all of the things that have now been brought forward about um, many of the seven members of government from the party of uh, the Finns have been there in the public uh, domain for years and nobody paid much attention. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say that those of us who said that it's a risk, it's gambling to go to the government with the party of the Finns, which does have an obscure background and connections to, to extreme right-wing uh, uh, groups, even violent groups. So, I mean, there we are. The, the, the moderate centre-right party is now in a coalition with a party that is creating surprises every day. Mm -hmm. The surprises should not have been surprises. And we also see that the, now the media is very actively looking into, into those uh, maybe past uh, errors. But I would say that um, the difference of, um, in terms of values uh, with the party of the, F the Finns and almost every other party in, in, in Finland is so sharp that it's, for me it's impossible to think uh, that they could be a governing party. A finance minister that has spoken out in a very rude way about uh, uh, people of other colour and ethnicity, even fantasizing with violence. I mean, this is unacceptable and it, it damages the reputation of our country every day now. Well, we'll... Uh Watch those future scandals, no doubt, with interest. Thank you so much, Heidi Hauteller, one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament. That's all for this part of the show. I'll be back after a short break with my, my panel of MEPs to debate whether tourism is ruining Europe's best-known hotspots. See you then. <laughs>